WFYI podcasts are made possible by Bloomington, Indiana, an American college town offering experiences like indulging in grub at Nick's English Hut, taking a stroll along Kirkwood Avenue, feeling the history and magic of Assembly Hall, and providing the chance to feel like a college kid again. Plan your trip at visitbloomington.com. I'm Kyle Long, host of Cultural Manifesto, just one of the local music programs you can enjoy on WFYI. These programs would not be possible without your financial support. And to say thank you, we want to send you to see Lyle Lovett when he comes to Indianapolis on July 28th. Choose a concert ticket as your gift when you donate at wfyi.org slash give. And thanks for supporting WFYI. This is WFYI News Now. It's June 21st, and I'm Abriana Heron. On today's show, Democratic gubernatorial nominee Jennifer McCormick announces her pick for running mate and new Title IX rules that would enshrine LGBTQ plus protections in Indiana schools were recently blocked by a U.S. District Court judge. The judge's preliminary injunction halts the rules in six states. Those stories coming up, but first, a new installment of our regular segment called The Checkup from Side Effects Public Media, where the health reporting team explores a single question sparked by a recent news story or maybe by one of our listeners. We're back today looking at the latest with H5N1, or bird flu. As you might remember, the virus has been found in cows for the first time ever. That's caused concern for some health experts who worry that infected cows mean the virus will have more opportunities to cross over into humans, which could mean a particularly deadly virus. A couple of months ago, the FDA said that commercial milk is safe because the pasteurization process kills any living virus. Now, some scientists are saying there's evidence that pasteurization may not be as foolproof as we hope. The checkup's question today is, how safe is dairy milk? I'm Lizzie McGreevy, side effect public media's community engagement specialist, and I'm joined today by health reporter Ben Thorpe. Hi. Hi, Ben. So what's it like to be a full-time milk reporter these days? Honestly, so far, it's been a lot more exciting than I think I would have anticipated. That's great. I'm glad you're putting more than just 2% into this reporting. (sighs) Yeah, I regret it. Okay. So, Ben, can you start off by talking about a recent letter to the New England Journal of Medicine, which found that some virus could be surviving the pasteurization process? What is happening there? Yeah, so I think it's important to underline up front that this is an experiment conducted in a laboratory setting. Scientists I spoke to about this letter said, hey, we don't know how replicable something like this is going to be outside of the lab. But the gist is this. Researchers spiked raw milk with high levels of H5N1 virus and then put it through two different pasteurization processes. One method involved heating up milk to 63 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. The other method was just 15 seconds at 72 degrees Celsius. I do think it's also worth noting that according to the International Dairy Foods Association, that 15-second pasteurization process is the most common process. Okay, Ben, I love to know about the science of pasteurization as much as the next gal, but why do we need to know the different methods of pasteurization? Well, okay, what researchers found is that that 15-second method still showed detectable levels of virus in milk. In fact, researchers say that there was still detectable virus up even to 20 seconds at 72 degrees. That means that there's a chance even after the pasteurization process, some live virus could be surviving. Okay, but again, and I'm putting every caveat in the book here, we don't know how those lab tests might translate into the real world. And I think it's also worth saying that the Food and Drug Administration has continued to affirm the safety of retail milk. The FDA sampled milk earlier this year, and while they did find evidence of H5N1 in retail milk, there was no live virus found. Okay, I love all the caveats, but that still sounds concerning to me. What's next? So experts behind the letter say they want more research into H5N1 in dairy production. They want to see whether their experiments are replicable. There's so much that we don't know about this virus right now, including what dose could infect humans through drinking it. I spoke with Dr. Amish Adalja, a senior scholar at Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. He says he's not particularly worried about what researchers are seeing in a laboratory setting. 
I think it's good information to have to understand the characteristics of pasteurization with this particular virus. But the bigger threat to me comes from unpasteurized milk. More broadly, though, Adalja says there isn't enough being done to track the virus and understand how widespread infections of cows and people really are. I don't believe that this strain of H5N1 is going to be the strain of avian influenza that causes a, a pandemic. However, it is a very good trial run that we're failing in. One last thing. The FDA is trying to reduce the sale of raw milk. The department put out a letter earlier this month underlining that while the FDA does not approve the sale of raw milk for human consumption, some states do. Their message was basically, hey, help us communicate to people that during the midst of this outbreak is maybe not the time to be drinking raw milk. They also called on states that permit the sale of raw milk to use regulatory authorities to try and stop some of those sales, especially in areas where infected herds have been identified. Well, this is all great information. Thank you, Ben, for keeping us up to date on H5N1. And I'm sure we'll be talking about it soon. Hopefully not too soon. Yes. But until then, if... Anybody has anything they would like addressed on checkup, please let us know and we will try to get that answered next time. Until then, stay safe. That was The Checkup, a segment from Side Effects Public Media. Side Effects is a regional health reporting collaboration of NPR member stations across the Midwest, based here at WFYI. Former state lawmaker Terry Gooden is Democratic gubernatorial nominee Jennifer McCormick's pick for running mate. And McCormick choosing the conservative Democrat is rankling some in the party. Gooden most recently worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He's a former school superintendent and 10-time state lawmaker. At the state house, he voted to ban gay marriage in 2011 and was a regular vote against abortion. Now he says his gay marriage vote was wrong and that the U.S. Supreme Court's reversal of abortion rights was an all-out assault. We must do everything we can to restore the rights of women to make decisions about their own body. McCormick, a former Republican, waves aside those concerns about discontent among Democrats. We are a huge tent, and in that big tent comes a lot of ideas and a lot of opinions and a lot of big hearts and a lot of big personalities. And just like a family, we will come together. Gooden will have competition for the nomination at the Indiana Democratic Party convention. Two others, Bob Kern and Cliff Marsiglio, have also filed to run for lieutenant governor. And for our final story today, new Title IX rules that would enshrine LGBTQ plus protections in Indiana schools were recently blocked by a U.S. District Court judge. From WFYI's Education Desk, Rachel Fredette reports on how a state lawsuit could delay the rules on sex-based discrimination. The judge's preliminary injunction halts the rules in six states. Attorney General Todd Rakita and other attorney generals from GOP-led states have challenged the Biden administration's new Title IX rules. Title IX prohibits sex discrimination in educational programs and activities. The judge's opinion says the Federal Department of Education overreached when they expanded sex to include gender identity. A spokesman for the department said they are reviewing the ruling and they stand by the regulations. The new rules were scheduled to take effect in August. I'm Rachel Fredette. That's all for today's episode of WFYI News Now. Our podcast is produced by Drew Dodlin with support from the news team at WFYI and public media journalists across the state. Our news director is Sarah Neal Estes. Kendall Antron produced our music. And I'm your host, Abriana Heron. If you liked today's episode, remember to subscribe and share. And follow WFYI on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube to check in on our newsroom throughout the day. Thanks for listening. We'll be back on Monday. WFYI podcasts are made possible by Bloomington, Indiana an American college town offering experiences like indulging in grub at Nick's English Hut, taking a stroll along Kirkwood Avenue, feeling the history and magic of Assembly Hall, and providing the chance to feel like a college kid again. Plan your trip at visitbloomington.com.